Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you very much. We're excited about this first session, um, which is, in my mind, about the most fundamental aspect of food, which is how it gets made, how something that is not food becomes food um, in a very material way. I'm Tracy Deutsch. I'll be moderating. Um, and I, just by way of short introduction, I teach in the history department, 20th century US history, gender, and political economy. Um, I'll briefly introduce the panelists and then we'll launch ahead to the papers. I'll ask folks to um, try and hold their questions until all the panelists have presented and then we'll have a Q&A at the end of the session. Um, so I'll introduce them in order. Um, Steve Strickler um, is a professor of anthropology and Latin American studies at the University of New Orleans. Um, he is um, the author of In the Shadows of State and Capital, The United Fruit Company and Popular Struggle and The United Fruit Company, Popular Struggle and Agrarian Restructuring in Ecuador, 1900 to 1995. That was published in 2001. He's also edited um, Banana Wars, Power, Production and History in the Americas, um, and is currently working on a book on international labor solidarity. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, he's also, in his most recent book, um, is called Chicken, The Dangerous Transformation of America's Favorite Food. That was published in 2007. Um, Psyche williams Forson joins us from the University of Maryland um, at College Park. She is the author of the award-winning book, um, Building Houses Out of Chicken Legs, um, Black Women, Food, and Power. That was published in 2006. Um, she has an edited collection coming out this fall, Taking Food Public, Redefining Foodways in a Changing World. That will be out this fall. And a work in progress that she is going to present on, on ways of expanding alternative food sources and rethinking the places from which people do and might be able to purchase food. Um, Kim Robian is um, an assistant professor um, in the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health at the School of Public Health here at the university. She is a registered dietitian, a nutritional scientist, and an epidemiologist um, whose research focuses on nutrition in relation to cancer prevention and survivorship. Um, she's also interested in environmental nutrition and sustainable food systems, and the extent to which exposure to pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, and other chemicals may contribute to the risk of cancer and other chronic diseases. Um, she's a member of the Public Health Nutrition and Nutrition Graduate Faculties here at the U, and an active member of the American Dietetic Association's Hunger and Environmental Nutrition Practice Group, as well as the American Public Health Association's Food and Environment Working Group. So she's really busy. We'll start with Steve. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's uh, great to be here. This is a wonderful conference. Um, I've also never been to Minnesota. Seeing the other end of the Mississippi River is very nice. Um, I'm actually not going to talk too much about how food gets made. Um, I started writing a paper about that, and then I started thinking more about the broader topic of how we talk about food, um, and then started sort of thinking about discussions I've had with my students, and spending a lot of time kind of in, I guess, activist circles too, as well, among progressive communities. And I, I started kind of a worker center um, in Arkansas that sort of helps immigrant workers. I've um, been involved in organizing restaurant workers and, and sort of thinking about some of those things. So this is sort of what I came up with. I think it may be a little, I don't know, out there, but who knows. Um, <laughs> what can I do is a question that constantly comes up in food discussions within and outside academia. Part of the difficulty, of course, is that the question itself has different meanings depending on who is doing the asking. Um, what can I do is really what can I do about such and such a problem which of course raises the question of who one is and how one defines and understands the problem at hand. Um, which in the case of feeding the world is no easy matter because the ways in which we do food are always changing um, and the problems are so numerous, entrenched, and, and deeply interconnected as well. Um, before saying something more, I'll give what I think is sort of <laughs> my limited punchline um, and offer up an answer at least that I'm increasingly coming to or at least a way of framing the problem. Um, and that is, we can't seriously address any of the long-standing and deeply entrenched problems surrounding the ways in which we do food in the U.S., and I think even perhaps globally, before we build an independent U.S. left, um, a movement that is a coherent, effective um, political and cultural force in public and mainstream life, 
that is capable of shaping institutional power and public policy, that is committed at the very least to the redistribution of wealth downward, and ideally to creating, articulating, pursuing, and organizing around an anti-capitalist vision. And um, this is not to say there are no leftists running around. For example, on the margins of labor, the labor movement, in academic offices, in student groups, among an anarchist underground, in nonprofits, or in all the kind of disparate causes and campaigns that currently animate the nominal left, create colorful spectacles of protest, and I think also give us the sensation that politics is happening when, in fact, we're not really, um, when we have little to show for it to a certain extent. What it is to say, for all practical purposes, is that the left boundary of mainstream American politics since the Clinton administration has been a democratic neoliberalism, whereby the Democratic Party has not simply abandoned its commitment to use the state to mitigate against inequalities produced by the market, but in fact uses the state to facilitate the rapid upward redistribution of wealth on national and global scales, which I think is just another way of saying that there is no left in the United States. The absence of a left, and a U.S. left in particular, is so important for food issues because the problem, or set of problems revolving around the way we do food, is really not about food at all, but about power and inequality, how political power and wealth are distributed under global capitalism. Hence, if we want to have deep changes in our food systems, we need a movement that is committed to, is capable of envisioning, is capable of articulating that vision in a way that resonates with the broader public, and ultimately capable of achieving a more democratic and equitable world. That's not to say that if political power and wealth were distributed more democratically that all our food problems would suddenly disappear, but it is to say that a more equitable distribution of power and resources, and, it, and I think including food, may be a prerequisite for tackling most of our food problems in a truly meaningful way, and that the only way of getting there is by building an independent left from the ground up. Nor is it to say that all short-term projects, all attempts at reform, are a silly waste of time and that we should all be tirelessly working for the revolution. But it does at least force us to ask I think an obvious question that seems oddly out, out of vogue in vaguely progressive circles today, and that is, what is the relation between short-term action and short, medium, and longer-term political goals? What is the relationship between, on the one hand, the work I'm doing, for, and this isn't me, I mean the I in general, um, for example, to promote organic food, make healthy food accessible, or fight Monsanto, um, and the longer-term project of creating a better world, which necessarily includes a world in which healthy food is affordable, accessible, sustainable, produced under just conditions, and, and I think just less about profit all around. Precisely because one of the things the left has traditionally been good at is pro providing a political rudder, a sense of where we are going, of envisioning and championing radically different worlds. As the old saying goes, when we don't know where we are going, any direction is as good as any other. It leads down two paths or tendencies. On the one hand, a portion end up disengaged, feeling that unless they devote their entire life to the cause, something few, few that really can afford to do, that there is no point in doing anything. A conclusion that often leads them to look for the assurance that if they buy the right chocolate, don't eat as much meat, adopt this or that technology, boycott this company, and make an annual contribution to the United Farm Workers, that they will be able to continue their lives guilt-free, more or less, as they've always envisioned. The second tendency, and I'm going to overstate this a bit, but the second tendency is the polar opposite of being disengaged, um, or roughly what Liza Featherstone, Doug Henwood, and Christian Parenti have called activistism, um, an anti-intellectual, hyper-pragmatic emphasis on acting, acting without analysis, where action is privileged regardless of its value, impact, direction, or connection to political aims. It can be found in local food movements, in a global justice movement, which often promotes the idea that the world's food problems will be resolved once all produce is locally grown, and among NGO and nonprofits, which, for whatever wonderful work they are doing, and I've been doing this myself, um, are ultimately in the business of selling press coverage of themselves, of their actions to foundation officers. And uh, again, I've done this myself. Um, act now, think later. In this respect, to touch on the conversation from yesterday, although I agree we often see a paradigmatic polarization between, on the one hand, say, agribusiness with its emphasis on technology, profits, increased productivities, etc., and on the other, the local, let's all be self-sufficient strain that has become pervasive, if not hegemonic, among a broad cross-section of vaguely progressive folks of all ages, I think that Claire referred to as the new tyranny, um, I don't think it's best to characterize this polarization as right versus left. Many, although not all, all within the local crowd, are either politically illiterate, apolitical, or politically impossible to pin down, um, and actually wear this as sort of a badge of honor, I think, in, in many cases. That, that the local, let's all be self-sufficient mantra has gained so much currency within so many circles is not a sign that the left exists. It's a sign that there's no serious left in the United States today.
that the, that the spaces for being exposed to or developing a critical, semi-coherent political analysis that helps one understand the world are becoming fewer and fewer. The fascination with the local, in a, particularly in a way that it's sometimes uncritically kind of bandied about, and I think there's some good things about it as well, um, emerges only in the absence of a real political analysis, understanding, or vision, or a desire to simply avoid politics completely. It is often apolitical, it is often state phobic, prone to conspiracy theory because any explanation seems to be as good as any other, and it is, often, it is, it is profoundly anti-intellectual, almost unwilling at times to critically look at alternatives. And these are currents, I think, that pervade both the left and the right um, in the current kind of context. To conclude, I'd also like to suggest that it's an argument for food studies. It's not only the case that in order to address many of our food problems that we need a U.S. left, but that food itself, critical discussions about food, is potentially a great way for building a left. It is fundamental to life and a commodity that people are currently quite interested in knowing um, by how, by whom, and under what, what conditions it got produced. It's great for making and understanding connections. People are more receptive to the idea that the market should not be the sole determiner of how food is produced, distributed, priced, etc., than they are with other commodities in particular. It's also, along with energy, a place where people are beginning to think about what an economy might look like that is not predicated and dependent on never-ending growth. It is, in a sense, a great starting place for critical thinking and alternative visions. Thank you. Okay, so sort of building off of Steve's paper, I'm going to uh, talk just a little bit about coming uh, a bit more down to the ground in terms of what some of those, putting some of those practical applications in place. So as uh, Tracy mentioned, I'm working on this project, which largely um, is born out of my own experience, but I'll say more about that in a minute. I want to start with the quote actually by Lisa Helke, which I really do like, um, comes from a paper that I heard her deliver a couple of years ago. Um, and she's, and I'm quoting now, she says, paper or plastic thinking begins by constructing our ethical choices as a dichotomy. Do this or do that. Would-be ethical consumers approach every alternative food campaign as a kind of moral, sociological, ecological litmus test. To be a good person, you must eat vegetarian, eat vegan, eat organic, eat local, eat biodynamic, eat fair trade, eat authentic, eat dot, dot, dot. I, these, I applaud these individual efforts to challenge the industrial agro-food system. I do not applaud their tendency to reduce moral life to a set of rigid choices that, if made correct, can quote unquote, make me good. So several years ago, in my own community, um, which I'll talk more about in a moment, I began frequenting the local Dollar Tree in order to benefit from purchasing same price goods. Seasonal decorations, gift bags, crafts, paper goods, school supplies, bleach, and other miscellany for my household. Now, from a budget perspective, of course, I could maximize my shopping in one stop. Over time, uh, my local value mark began to make the one-stop shopping experience even more convenient by expanding their line to include consumable food products such as bottled water and a host of dry goods. It was a subtle change, this expansion into food products, and yet it was a change that was both welcoming and troubling. As a wife and mother, it could make my often tedious errand list relatively shorter. As I noticed the inventory increased to include such items as wheat bread, bagels, and English muffins, I also noticed the installation of refrigeration. The next thing I knew, the dollar store was offering everything from turkey bacon to eggs, cheese, and frozen vegetables. As a food scholar, however, it made me wonder, who is buying food from the uh, dollar store? More to the point of this essay, at a time when food access and security is on the minds of food system researchers, why has no one considered the role of the value market as an immediate alternative to food acquisition? At a time, too, of rapidly changing sources of food supply and demand, how are these stores being utilized by communities as a source for reducing dimensions of food insecurity? So, in all, I encourage our consideration in this discussion of stores, markets, and networks that challenge how we define terms like alternative and also sustainability. Lastly, this discussion seeks to encourage debate in a field of study that too often and too readily embraces an either-or option, what Helke refers to as a paper or plastic mentality. So again, while we work to create a new left, which I absolutely agree with, 
um, and redistribute sources. I realize that that is a, 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 a mammoth undertaking. I also want to look at what people are doing uh, in the trenches on the everyday sort of life point of view to survive. So increasing years, as we all know, uh, more and more attention has been paid to processes of food production, distribution, acquisition, and consumption that tend to operate apart from but within conventional food systems. And many advocates see the solution as tapping into alternative food networks, right, AFNs, food, uh, uh, farmers markets, co-ops, community-sponsored agriculture sites, and the like. Not only there can you obtain fresh food, but also a sense of connection with the people, places, and processes involved with growing and supplying your food. Though generally small in scale, we know these are multifaceted and variegated. Though the focus in these discussions most often tends to be on the food, I think it serves primarily as well to obscure the real culprits, structural inequalities, racism, and poor city planning among them. But let's consider for a moment this whole concept of the alternative food. The independent, community-owned, and operated market seems to be considered the harbinger of progress for food systems in the developed world that have run amok. Participation in these markets is seen to represent the wave of progress of the future, at least here in the USA. But is the alternative that is touted and presented before us the best option, let alone the only one? Food activism in the U.S. has focused largely on developing alternatives, as I mentioned, but why must these alternatives be the ones that are prescribed and accepted? These activists have been heavily critiqued for lack of attention to issues of privilege, race, and class, let alone assuming they are wise enough to suggest what others should be eating. Julie Guffman, in her revealing essay, Bringing Food to Others, shares that AFNs tend to cater primarily to the well-off. They offer, as we know, for example, niche products, free-range eggs, chickens, buffalo meat, $50 turkeys, arugula, artichokes, sprouts, and so on. She asserts, in fact, that they are so yuppified that they have earned the moniker yuppie chow. And, of course, um, we know that these terms, um, such as food deserts and others, are heavily loaded uh, and need to be unpacked. The food security activists used to draw our attention to uh, spaces that are filled with lack of access, affordability of fresh, healthful food in communities of color. The problem, I feel like there's a, okay. The problem is not always that food stores don't exist. It is that the food stores don't exist that sell the right food according to the right formula. So again, I want to turn our attention for a moment to the whole concept of absence. It often means that we miss the potential to engage in discussions that cause us profound discomfort. However, the focus is less on the, because the focus is less on the actual structural inequalities and more on the food. Take, for instance, the urban food security projects previously, um, that I previously alluded to, like CSAs and so forth, that assume knowledge, access, and cost are the primary barriers to more healthful eating. Guthman, who I'm quoting from again, says, much of the on-the-ground work is focused on donating, selling at below market prices, or growing fresh fruits and vegetables, and educating residents to the quality of locally grown seasonal and organic food. There's a lot of assumptions being made in these initiatives, aimed largely at African Americans, who I mentioned at least a generation ago, cl uh, claimed such ways of living as central. So I'm just going to show you two of these urban um, projects and that's because these two are, are very much in the, in the public domain, although there are others that certainly could be um, pointed to. Most of you are familiar with Will Allen, who I see is going to be coming or has come here. And so he has this whole project that um, uh, uh, centers around growing power. And then there's another project in Detroit, which was featured on MSNBC, um, called Peaches in Green, and it's a moving a uh, van that goes around to different communities to um, provide fresh fruits and vegetables. What I found very interesting about Peaches and Green is the way in which it's been uh, sort of publicized to us, right? These are some of the pictures they show. So we have this sort of missionary intention to bring the fresh fruit to the little black girl. And then that picture in the lower, uh, in this lower corner here, the little boy with the dollar, just eyes peering just over the truck. These kinds of images bear very much to be um, unpacked. 
And so you see these kinds of, uh, peaches and green actually has a location where, as you see here, they have a variety of foods that cater to uh, communities uh, that would use them, obviously, habaneros, prickly pear, uh, yucca, jicama, plantain, and the like. But even in uh, these kinds of environments, there are several alternatives. Not everyone, for example, is doing the same job. There are people who are working the register. Others are doing the gardening. Some are delivering the food. Why then can't this model of alternatives extend to the discourse on alternative foods? It's simple, it seems to me, but I think it's also profound. One of the things that ends up happening is we have this discourse that begins to ask the question, that begins to form, be, that is formulated in such a way that it really focuses the question, according to Julie Guthman, on why blacks don't participate in these kind of alternative food movements. What government suggests is that we reframe the question to not why blacks won't participate, but why is there white desire to enroll black people in a particular set of food practices. Clearly we know that some blacks are involved in the kinds of alternative food networks that I've mentioned, just as there are some whites that are not, and other ethnic and racial groups beyond. But discourses tend to see a white subject and black other when it comes to the concept of alternative. I wonder what happens when we expand the concept of alternative food networks to consider networks that are formed in other ways around different kinds of access. Jeff uh, Rum helps us to see this more succinctly, particularly as it relates to the notion of putting your hands in the soil. He says it like this, and I'm quoting, remember land was given away free to whites at the same time that reconstruction failed in the south. Native lands were appropriated and <coughs> natives exterminated. The Chinese and Japanese precluded from land ownership and the Californios disenfranchised of their ranches. So we have to be careful about this insistence that people of color return to the land because not everyone has a loving relationship to the land that others might imagine. In fact, even today in this agrarian imaginary still persists because you have mostly white land ownership that's being worked by mostly non-white labor. So I'm concerned with this mission nutrition, which I read as save the black people. One of the problems, as Guthman suggests and others suggest, is the cultural coding that takes place. I received this flyer just yesterday from my daughter's school. Uh, we live in predominantly African-American county. We live in Prince George's County. It is known, in fact, as the, it has the distinction of being the richest majority African-American county in the country. It's a little confounding to me that we would receive, in some ways, this whole uh, flyer about the need to get free, fresh produce. Where, more or less, too, is the discourse of choice in all of this? Framing the discourse so that African American and or black people are the object of the mission is not the subject of, and uh, not the subject of their own destinies is, for me, part of the problem. Um, again, my work tends to stem around finding ways to read empowerment in the lives of people as they exist. Here is one such example on which I will end. This is a woman known as the Dollar Diva. This is Elizabeth Fisher, who comes from a background of thrift. She right now takes care of her 88-year-old mother, and they live in Philadelphia. Um, Elizabeth shops at dollar stores, and what she found was when she was going there to buy all kinds of things for her mom, including spices and other things, she could actually make a delectable type meal on a very low budget. She put together a cookbook called Dining with the Dollar Diva, delicious menus with ingredients costing one dollar or less. The other thing I want to emphasize are other alternatives. In Maryland, for example, we have the Share Food Network. And nationally, there's the Angel for Food Network. Also, we have food auctions. And, of course, you have those underground sources that are illegal, but that do provide sustenance to various communities. So I end where I began with my own experience, and I point to the fact that people develop strategies for making food choices, including sensory perceptions, values, money, convenience, health and nutrition, and others, in their own way as first at all acknowledge in their work on food choices, and I'm quoting, conceptualizing food choice is a complex process with a range of influences and values that are negotiated differently by diverse people in a variety of settings. Recognizing this will help all of us be much more holistic in our view of food practices and efforts to improve dietary behaviors. If in fact our goal is really to improve life ways of people and assist them in ensuring access 
that will uh, have, then we need to heavily consider people's life courses and decisions that are best for them, their values and desires. I know it won't be easy. There is no quick fix, but it seems to me this is the most humane solution. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, and sort of building a little bit on what uh, Psyche brought up, I think that there's a real move within the field of public health and nutrition to do, um, rather than, to, it, I think our old model was to charge right in with our plans and we were gonna decrease obesity in communities and we were gonna decrease hypertension and diabetes and go after all of those chronic diseases. There's a real move within public health and nutrition to do uh, community assessments and to do what's called community-based participatory research where prior to any type of design of an intervention, we would definitely do an assessment, determine, um, hopefully we would have identified <laughs> that Prince Williams County, or um, Prince George, that's mm -hmm. it, Prince George. Um, was one of the more affluent communities, and perhaps that wasn't something that we should be concerned about, targeting our um, resources elsewhere. Um, and also engaging the community in what the, what the intervention should be and what they want and what they see as culturally appropriate. In many cases, it's actually individuals from the community implementing the intervention as opposed to the academics coming in and saying this is what we think that you should have. Um, the other thing is that, um, and I'm probably the last person who should be speaking on this, I have colleagues who have thought an awful lot about this, but. I'm the representative from our division here today, so I'll bring this up. Um, there's also a real interest in thinking about um, sort of an ecologic framework and all of the different levels and trying to come up with ways of thinking about how people make decisions about food and um, looking at different judgments that people might make at different times. Obviously, there's been a lot of interest on looking at the most basic factor, looking at individual factors, personal factors on how we make food choices. There was a lot of interest originally in trying to change individual behavior. And I think that within our field of public health nutrition, we've now moved beyond that to say, um, that we really need to be thinking about some of the other levels of this ecologic framework and making those changes so that people can make the best food choices that they can. So the other levels um, sort of building out from the environment, or from the individual factors are the social environment. So um, things like your peer network, your family, um, there's a lot of interest within public health in general it's starting to look at social networking and how that impacts health and how that impacts um, there was a very famous study that came out um, in the past year about how our friends influence our weight. <laughs> how we tend to. Um, so, anyways, that type of model being used on food choices. Also, the physical environment. Um, you know, we're a captive audience in schools and in our workplace, and how do we change our food options there? I know I work in the West Bank office building, which we feel like is way out in Timbuktu for the rest of the campus. We don't have a cafeteria in our office building. Those of us who like to work late, I'm not a morning person. Um, our options when we get that hunger pain at 6 o'clock is the vending machine. And I have to say, I know better. But those potato <laughs> chips are still calling me at 6 o'clock at night. But I don't have a choice. I'm a captive of that, that physical environment. And how do we change that to help people make better food choices? And then, of course, the macro level things, um, things like government policy, um, industry, um, marketing, um, food subsidies, that type of thing. Um, and how do we um, influence that aspect to make things ultimately easier for the individual to make the best food choices for themselves. So um, those were some of the, the key points that I wanted to bring up around public health nutrition and I guess I'll leave it at that. I wanted to have a session where we st where we could start out by talking about the labor that goes into creating food because I think that that really makes contingent a lot of the things that we think of as non-contingent in a lot of different systems around um, impoverishment, around uh, class, around gender. That if you look at the the sheer work the labor of getting food into people's houses and of making something that is not yet food, whether it's meant to be or not, something that, that people eat, that suggests a lot of the points at which these large systems are, are disruptable and, and constantly disrupted, necessarily 
unstable and disrupted. Um, so I think it's a really powerful way of um, suggesting both the possibilities for food, for thinking about food and food politics, and um, as well as suggesting the embeddedness of um, systems of food and food provisioning and food production in other larger systems. So it, it's a nice, for me, it's a productive, if I can use that pun, a productive place to stand um, <coughs> to get at the contingencies of food, but as well as its embeddedness in other systems, the way it kind of is a thread that unravels a lot. Yes, you're right. But while we're dealing with the wrong, people still have to live. So my concern is, while we are trying to make those macro changes, how do I help the low-income people in my church, for example, deal with this economic crisis and get food on their table this week? And so if my job then is to say to them, if you have $20, let me show you how you can make some good options at a dollar store. Let's say you buy canned tomatoes. What can you make with that in order to feed your children today? I can't, and they can't wait until we change the food system. Okay, I understand corn has problems. I understand chicken has problems. I understand all of that. But you cannot say that to a hungry person. You cannot tell them you can't eat those beans because they may have too much sodium. Mm -hmm. And I understand that there are health consequences on the back end. So how do I help them then maybe rinse the beans or find some other ways to do what they have to do? Because my concern is helping people where they are right now. So then that may mean you have to get out and walk a block or walk your kid to school so you can work off that sodium or what have you. Maybe that means you have to buy bottled water and not drink the soft drinks. But I have to help people, I think, in my work, deal with right now. Because they can't wait until we change the food system. African American people could never wait until the mackerel took place. <laughs> we had to do what we had to do. We couldn't sit and wait for somebody to bring it to us. When we left enslavement, we had to walk and find our families. If we waited for people to help us do that, we'd never have found them. So my concern really is more about, <clears throat> and not just African American people, all people not just poor people, middle class. How do we help people right now, right here, make informed choices so that child does not go to school during the week of MSA, the Maryland State Assessment Test, and be hungry and can't take her test and do well because she has no food? So that would be my concern. Um, and I understand the choice is not always a good one, but my belief is let's make the best choice with what we have right here, right now. But, and just to follow up on that, what we've actually learned in nutrition counseling is it's sort of, you really need to address Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. Unless you've taken care of the immediate, mm -hmm. you cannot, people just are not receptive to the long term. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is a struggle. I mean, there's a finite amount of resources. <coughs> Public health programs are always underfunded, mm -hmm. understaffed. And where do you dedicate the most? Mm -hmm. It really is the here and now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, finding time to do all of these other things is sort of an extra. And um, I worked uh, as a, or I was a director for quite some time. Of, um, I guess I should say I was on the board of something called the Chicago Consortium to Lower Obesity in Chicago Children. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would talk about uh, the ecological model of health quite a bit where you sort of start out with the individual stand up. So you go out, <laughs> and, uh, around that's the family, and around that is in terms of explanation is the community and then it goes out to social structures. And you know, oftentimes the interventions were in here on the individual, but sometimes they go up. And a lot of times the idea of doing C V P R, of doing community based research, is about trying to push that and um, again, the critiques may not be as, I guess, deep as, as we in social science are used to talking about, but the fact that, um, that, that scientists are doing this, 
I think is really important, and I think is a is a is a place for connection. I think that was part of the point that I think it does have to come from the ground up. I mean, along those lines. I mean, I don't. I mean, I guess I. Yeah, I mean, maybe my, my paper was pessimistic. I think maybe I am pessimistic. I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't see that right now. I mean, I think there. I mean, I think food. I think can do what you say it does, which is that it, there can be this process of politicization. And I, and I think on some level that's kind of like the question is, how do you make the small projects, like the here and now projects that have to be done, how can those be a political experience for people on some level? Because, I mean, there are here and now projects that have to be done, and there are here and now projects that are silly that don't need to be done, and we spend a lot of time on those and they don't move us in a political direction. And then there are other ones that don't seem political, um, but that I think often have the potential for awakening something in people. But I also do think that there's a powerful current of, of apolitical, um, state-phobic, um, anti-intellectualism that's running through um, many circles. And I, when I say, and I would say what I consider to be people that I would hope would be progressives, or that I think when you initially start to talk with them, I would say, wow, this seems like a progressive person, and then the conspiracy theories start to come out. Or the, I mean, and I see that a, a lot. I'm, I mean, I... I mean, maybe it's, I don't, you know, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not optimistic because I live in New Orleans and I work in Columbia, um, but, you know, not like places with hope, or, you know, but, I mean, I do agree that that's sort of where it kind of has to come up. I do also think, though, that, um, and this is where I think, like, like, intellectuals play a role, is that there does need to be some, like, broader envisioning or, like, a, a, a sense of getting alternative visions out into a public discourse in a way that they're really not right now. I mean, if you, if you sort of ask, like, like, like for my students, it's like, where would they go to look for, um, you know, you really have to look hard <laughs> in the U.S. right now for something that you could tap into and would say that that's sort of a left discourse. I mean, you really, it, it's not sort of readily available, and neither are sort of the avenues for activism in a way that they were, I think, in, in the past. And so there's a sense of having no sense of which, which kind of direction to go, and I think the internet doesn't kind of help this on some level as well. I mean, there's all sorts of things, but I mean, I think it's definitely ground up, but I think there needs to be, like, people making connections between, okay, how does this local project fit into some sort of broader political, you know, project or vision? Because it, it's amazing to me within progressive circles how infrequently what seems to me is an obvious question isn't asked. And it almost makes me nostalgic about, like, that's all the left used to talk about. They never used to act. I mean, you used to have these sort of, you know, the Trotskyists versus the Maoist. I mean, that's sort of an, but, but that, and this sort of fetishism of analysis, now it's sort of gone the other way, I think, on some level. And that's, I think, troubling. What I struggle with in this whole thing is I totally get the here and now and that those needs have to be met. But I also, the whole, like, the role of the corporations and the role, I, you know, I don't know that agricultural scientists really have as much leeway. There's not all that much money out there to do um, research on things that aren't funded by Monsanto and Cargill. And I've seen <coughs> in meetings with high ups of, in this own university who say the next place we need to go to get more money because we aren't getting public money is to Cargill and Monsanto. And I just cringe and I think, you know, sitting last week in meetings with some of the, you know, some of the people who are really trying to take on some of these big powers and feeling like even the USDA is kind of cowering to um, to these forces and it's you know, I mean, we have to do both at the same time, so, but there doesn't seem, I mean, I, you know, I, I, the, the, the organic, Moses Organic Conference, there are people who've really, really been thinking about this and have been talking with people in Washington about how do we change this, how do we get rid of, you know, how do, how do we go back on the GE alfalfa, if you all are at all familiar with that, when it's been pushed that now genetically engineered alfalfa. Um, is is unregulated, and you know the farmers I talk to, which you don't even you know need you don't need to spray off alfalfa. Alfalfa is one of those things. So it's just so complex, and I'm a, I think I'm I used to be so optimistic, but it's 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 such a big problem, and it doesn't really seem like 
how do you get the wheels turning? And, and it's it's a power thing. I mean, it's the corp. I kind of feel like there are a number of corporations and people who have so much power, and the rest of us um, really don't have a lot. And I'm looking for the way of, of how how you know we do. I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and respond to that quickly, uh, which is to say I, I think about capitalism a lot, and so I think about big structures, um, as well as very small everyday acts of food purchasing. And one thing that struck me in my research was the ways that food, in particular, it's almost like it opens up the ways that those structures of powers are encased. It's like stripping the wires, almost, because um, there are these large structures that constrain and that limit, but there are also these moments where they can be disrupted. They depend on very particular kinds of behaviors that are always in danger of being undone. So I probably shouldn't be this abstract about it. Um, for instance, um, Monsanto being able to sell, like the sell, the selling of genetically engineered alfalfa or genetically engineered food depends on people being willing to distribute it, being willing to process it, being willing to use it. That can be seen as a sort of integrated, difficult to disrupt process or as a very disruptible process that has a lot of nodes to it. And I think that food is a point at which at least it feels to people like a place where all of those, at least one of those nodes, which is all it takes, can disrupt the process. So that's my point of hope. Can I also say something? It's funny for me to be sitting here listening to these conversations about big power pushbacks. Because I come from a community of people who have never been able to enforce necessarily big power pushbacks. We have always worked on the ground in small groups and then coalesced and, and worked with other people. So it, it's very interesting as the only pretty much person of color, maybe one or two of us in this room, um, having this conversation about fighting the powers that be on a big level. Because my own social activist background, which began with my parents coming out of the civil rights movement, was always about, let's go buy chicken dinner so we can help to raise money to get Joanne Little out of jail. You see, that's our fight the power. And so I don't see it as an either or again, but I think that we need to be attuned to the ways in which disenfranchised people need to operate on a very, that's why I keep talking about the here and now, because you're talking about a whole segment of the population who cannot even begin to even get near a table to have a conversation, a conversation about Cargill. They'll look at you, who is Cargill? You know, short of hearing it on a Sweet Honey in the Rock song, we were talking about yesterday about are my hands clean, they're like, who? Oh, Exxon, that's where I get my gas. They don't, you're talking about people, the, the majority of the population, and rapidly, this is becoming even more so, um, don't have access to these conversations writ large. So I would just urge us, as we are continuing to talk about fight the power, that recognize you're, of, you're in the minority in this conversation, but you have the most power. Those of us who are in the majority are still trying to figure out some other things, and we're trying to bring you perhaps along with us to fight that. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying that it has to be either or. That was the whole purpose of my talk. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to be reminded um, often that the majority of the people who still exist in the United States do not have access to those power structures. You're certainly right, and, and this is the pro This is part of the complexity also. Some of these issues have regional variations, um, because one of the things I didn't talk about in the interest of time is in um, our county, we also have an, an, an increasingly um, growing, by leaps and bounds, multinational population. So we have a whole community of Salvadorians, you know, Mexicans, so forth. But, What's also cropping up are these specialty stores, which is, for me, another issue of the Alternative Food Network. Um, my sister-in-law, because my husband's from Ghana, 
owns a African Caribbean Latino market. That's how they are. They are because they because we all share the same foods, right? Right. right, right. So these are also places where people are going to buy their yam and their prickly pear, like I said, and their kenke and you know fufu. But now we're seeing places like Aldi, and pretty soon probably the dollar store is going to be stocking that. So you know, I mean, there's just it, it, it's it's a just a mixture of options there. Um, and, and this is expansive, I should say. Um, so I don't know about whether or not those spaces are, are any more, in, in some cases, disciplined or regulated than some of the smaller markets that you go into where you start to see some of that taking place as well. I don't know. Again, I, this is why I kind of have problems with the either or, because there's so many different variations and there's no consistency in terms of across the board, this applies. There's just, I just don't see a one size fitting all with the food discussion. I think it's so obvious that, on some level, that it, it amazes me that it circulates with such sort of legitimacy. I mean, personally, I think it means abandoning cities, reducing population by about three quarters to 80% of the population living in the world and basically sort of abandoning industrial civilization kind of as we know it. I mean that I mean literally I think that it's great. for that to, for for that model to sort of happen, I think that's kind of what what would be required. You know, I mean I'm off I, mean, I sort of made an argument for coming up with radical visions of the world um, and, and sort of, you know, all this sort of stuff. That's just not one that's gonna happen. And so it seems that just seems like so far off the map to me that I think the more interesting or an equally interesting question is kind of why that has become so prevalent. Yes. Um, and and I think part of it again for me is sort of like a, a desire to um, move away from politics and sort of almost opt out on some level, um, which is which is possible for a segment of the population, but for the, the, the masses, the global world, you know, kind of isn't. Um, I think, again, it's sort of a very, among a lot of these folks, it's um, just a profound distrust of the potential of the state um, and for harnessing state power to sort of come up with some sort of kind of broader coordinated um, project. I mean, I also do think there's an anti-intellectualism that runs through it as well. That, uh, again, sort of a um, <laughs> forego analysis. Um, you know, we shouldn't be analyzing it. We should just be acting, um, and, and that's sort of part of it. But I mean, I, I suspect other people have other ideas of why. It, I mean, I think it circulates within progressive circles. I think it circulates within academic circles. I think it circulates at any farmers market that you go to in the United States. I mean, I think it, it's it's you know, it's not, um, a, I think it circulates around within some of my close friends who are very, very smart people, um, I think. I mean, I think it's very pervasive um, in, in that sense. I mean, I wouldn't say maybe it's quite hegemonic, but within certain circles, I mean, it's to sort of even, I don't know, I, I find it hard to sometimes have a conversation about it. With, with Maybe I'm, again, not the best person to do it because it's not my area of expertise, but I, I know a lot of my colleagues rely on the USDA food atlas mm -hmm. data sets that are available. And, you know, I think there's, I think we all recognize that there's errors in the data that we have and it's a matter of refining it and who has the time and who has the money. And is USDA um, applying resources to improving that? No, I mean, Jerry and I talked about this yesterday um, because I, I, the other work that I'm doing right now is on underground economies and mm -hmm. women who provision food in those right. spaces. Um, in this article I just wrote about other women cook for my husband because I was not, um, I, one of the examples I give is driving across town to the, to the woman who makes the watches <coughs> and go inside and get this food and come back out and, you know, voila, there's dinner for us. It's great, you know, but she's off the books. Mm -hmm. She's off the radar. So I guess I'm just, again, um, going back to what Jerry said, there are these hidden food spaces that really do serve, from my standpoint of sustainability, to sustain people culturally, socially, economically, politically.
Um, and I, that's one reason why in our department, when we talk about sustainability, we always have to introduce that fourth pillar. It's not the triple bottom line. It's actually more of a quadruple, if you will, bottom line. And you have to take into consideration those cultural elements. That's my point. I think we should not, uh, my concern is that we not bow to the altar of one prescription over another, but rather that we embrace all the options. That's, that's my point. Let's just expand what alternative means. Alternative could mean that I'm going to do this versus doing that, or I'm going to do a little, a hybrid of both. Yeah. I'm going to jump in and reinforce that point by, with some yeah. historical perspective, because poor people, as well as some middle class people, have always done that. Only at the so turn of one or the other. Yeah, at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, that was a problem, mm -hmm. and they got arrested for growing gardens mm -hmm. where there were supposed to be parks. Let's back it up even earlier. Sure. During periods of enslavement, <laughs> right? Depending right. upon your problem. region and what kind of plantation you were perhaps placed on, you may were able to have a garden to supplement the foods that you were issued by your slave master. You may have been able to barter. You may have been able to sell. You may not have been able to sell. You may have been on a plantation where you all start. You may have had to result to theft. My point is these options have always been plentiful. I'm not sure why we have to now come down on either one or the other. Remember, I started with Lisa's argument about the paper or plastic mentality and the dichotomy. That's what I'm trying to get away from. The larger article which, to which this contributes will look at a variety of different alternatives. The dollar store and the value mark being one. But I'm also, as I said, interested in the underground economy. I'm interested <coughs> in the AFNs. I'm interested in, but I'm also very cognizant of the fact that sometimes you have African Americans of my generation who say, I'm not working the CSA. As I shared with some folks before, they were like, that to me is too close to sharecropping. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have to be respectful and mindful of that as well. I'm also very clear that, you know, again, depends upon where you are and what the movement is looking like. My daughter's school just last week, we're in the only green school in the county of Prince George's, um, just started to begin a garden. It's going to be very interesting to me with the majority um, people of color population in that school, how many folks actually come out and engage in that over the long term and for what reasons. Mm -hmm. So that's going to become another one of my op participant observation sites. So I, I, I'm for all of it. I don't want to foreclose on any possibilities if people are going to get fed. Yeah, Rick and well, I just, I appreciate very much what you're saying, um, Psyche. I also think that there is um, a pervasive dualistic passion running through the food movement right now, mm -hmm. which is intent on dividing the world into good and evil. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, We've been having this discussion over the last few days on the ASFS listserv, mm -hmm. which I know several Maybe people right. here yeah. subscribe to, where, where Janet Cherzan posed the question, where does this intense passion come mm -hmm. from? Mm -hmm. And without kind of being a fundamentalist Marxist, mm -hmm. I have to go back to chapter one of, um, of Das Kapital, mm -hmm. where Marx defines the commodity and talks about the work of decommodification and fetishizing of the commodity as something that we all do in our homes when we, when we buy these objects in the store and we try to convert them out of the commodity form into something human and something social. And it seems to me that this is part of the passion that's driving this movement is the desire for something beyond commodities, for something that's meaningful and has qualities mm -hmm. rather than just a price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the lack of a left in a labor movement and a critique of capitalism is directly related <laughs> to the passion that people have for a non-commoditized food and for an alternative to the things that they buy in Walmart. So that even when Walmart bows down and says, okay, I'll give you organic food. Okay, I'll give you local food. They're missing the point, which is that people want really organic and local as a, as a commodity. They want to get it from, 
they want it decommodified before they consume it. And and I think that, that we have to kind of pay attention to that that passion because it's it's there and it's very, very strong. And yeah, sometimes it's misguided because they're not, you know, going in the direction that we think they should be going. But I think that the the passion, if we can understand it, is immensely powerful. And I think the po political leaders in this country just have no idea what's going on at that level. They have, and when it comes, when it starts to hit them, it's going to come as a complete surprise. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I, I think that's that's why I'm more optimistic than um, than this panel. It has, it, I mean, there's a lot of very big structural issues um, to deal with, but I think that um, we can over-intellectualize it a bit too much and, and not recognize that there's a, an immense groundswell of, of, um, of power, unfocused, not particularly, it's not the old left. But it's, it's uh, I think it is going to go somewhere. There's something there about identity and tying it to kind of political action. Because part of the problem is when it's just individualized and, you know, it's everybody's own identity, or various people's own identities, you know, it's problematic. And the question is how do you politicize that? And how does, you know, how, where, when, how do you get the analysis to, you know, to come to bear on that passion? You know, that a lot of people feel about, and I think you really hit it on the nose with that question, you know, the, your analysis of the decommodification thing. I think that's absolutely right. Because there's, that's what's, why there's so much energy around this, no matter how problematic and elitist and, you know, and it is. You know, and there are a lot of crit academic critiques we can do of it, and we do. Um, but, I mean, there is also <coughs> political, there's energy there, and somehow it's got to be, uh, recognized and organized and seized. But in the words of, of some of the best gender studies, the personal is political, right? right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So we got to remember that as well. Right. One of the things that we were really excited about from a nutrition standpoint was that was um, getting back to home ec skills and the ability to cook and, and shop for yourself was one of the key recommendations from the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Council this time around that actually made it all the way into the Dietary Guideline recommendations, which is a new development. And so we were excited about that. But, um, and, you know, maybe Tracy can speak more to this, but I know as someone who went through a dietetics program in the early 80s, there was a big movement away from home ec and, you know, the women's movement, and this was a women's dominated field. And, got to get away from that. And I had I remember I had colleagues in the 80s who so everything was clinical. We were all going to work in, you know, with Novartis and Abbott with their manufactured food items. We don't do food anymore. And I think that there's a huge circle around in the field of nutrition to come back to. But the only way that we're going to really make food real to people and be able to really um, counsel people again is getting people back to the concept of being able to cook <laughs> and not relying on shelf stable products which um, to me even though it may be labeled organic if it's in a package and it's shelf stable there's other things to it um, that we need to be considering but I think you know it's kind of telling in that a lot of our public we've had several public health nutrition students and Paul was actually on one of our students committees they all want to do school gardening and they all want to look at it from the health standpoint. I mean, not just that local foods movement and getting people involved, but it's amazing to me how many times you see and you hear anecdotes of kids not knowing the difference between different types of vegetables. And how can we ever teach them to eat more fruits and vegetables, which we know will decrease the risk of chronic diseases and being <coughs> overweight unless they actually get their hands into that and cooking and so I'm doing home ec skills That's what very you right, in your talk. but not yes, I am doing that, and I'm doing it in different ways. And so I guess the thing that, as I was saying to a group of master gardeners who I'm going to be talking with in a couple of weeks, and they got mad because I sort of said I don't do outdoor gardening with worms and snakes. I don't I don't like it. I didn't like it when I was in rural Virginia. I don't like it 
when I'm in the suburbs of Maryland. I don't do squirrely things. Okay? <laughs> what I do on my porch is I say to my daughter, let's throw our old pumpkin over and watch it compost and see what happens when it grows. And I say, let's grow this in this little, um, in this little bin right here. Let's just put a couple of herbs and see what happens when they come up. And so that's why I keep going back to the local and the small because that's the only thing I can do right now to show her your food does not come out of a can. You know, it comes from this place and comes, I don't have time to ring a chicken snack, you know, but, and I'm not saying that facetiously, I'm saying, but that's the kind of pushback I feel like you get sometimes from these groups. Like this gardener woman got very quiet and she was like, well, then you don't garden. I said, I container pot, whatever you want to call it, all right? But so we got into this whole sort of argument. But when you have these huge discourses dictating right. to you what X, Y, and Z should be, I fit outside the norm, perhaps, of the future homemaker of America. But you're also yeah. okay. doing home ex skills. Absolutely, you know, right I know now, that. Right, but somehow, right, but somehow the discourse seems to have changed to something that has been put down upon us as right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm gonna just that. interrupt to say that's not new about home ec. No, right. right, it's not. It I mean, home ec has a long history of being okay. prescriptive. prescriptive. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Prescriptive Absolutely. and norm normalizing yes. and normatizing, mm -hmm. particularly around gender. Absolutely. A topic I will just point out that has not come up very much yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I know a lot of people want to get it. Um, so, that, that this is about the problems with future homemakers of yeah. America, as well mm -hmm. as the work of being, home of work. having to do, mm -hmm. uh, be, doing that kind of work, home keeping work. people together. Home work. That's right. That is not paid. Okay, Valen. When I first started writing this paper, um, I actually think I was talking more about what you probably wanted, um, which was which was kind of the labor of production, particularly on banana plantations where I worked, and then I spent two summers working in a Tyson poultry plant and sort of talking about about that. And and it, I mean, I think it's a great educational tool for kind of talking about all the absurdities of agribusiness. Um, you know, from I mean, Tyson. I think makes over 7,000 different chicken products, um, to all the awful things that go on in poultry plants, um, and all the awful things that go on on banana plantations for workers, which would get into gender and all sorts of things. Right. In the end, then, what I always get the question, and this has sort of been the rest of the paper, is like, what, what can be done about that? Um, because those are industries that, where power is extremely concentrated. Um, where I mean, there's the, probably nothing worse almost than the banana industry in the mm -hmm. sense that I mean, they, if if you start some labor trouble on in Costa Rica, then they go to Ecuador. You know, I mean, they are really global and they move around, and and or you can say like with you know poultry processing plant. Well, we should work towards laws that slow down the speed of the production line. That would be certainly a thing that moves in the right direction. I mean, but all of those things, all of the things that I could come up with, which were practical sorts of things are very difficult to achieve in the absence of a labor movement. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think, a, or a, a left that is, is where the labor movement is very strong. Um, and so that, like, and, and that's where I was left, like I sort of left, well, I'm going to give this, but I think a lot of the people in the audience sort of know all the absurdities of agribusiness, and, I, and maybe that's not necessary. And I, and I don't come at this sort of from, I, I don't work within alternative food type stuff, and so my, my, maybe that's why I'm not as hopeful that I don't sort of see some, some of this kind of other stuff. But like, if you work in the banana industry, or you work in the poultry industry, or now I'm working on coal in Colombia, um, it, you know, to again, it's not hopeful, but also it's 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 difficult to see these things changing without a serious labor movement kind of in those countries globally, in, in some cases, and those kinds of things. And I guess that's kind of where. You know, I sort of come at it. I mean, getting back to the land grant thing, I mean, I sort of, the panel yesterday was extremely informative for me, and I kind of knew some of it, um, but my experience at the University of Arkansas, where I taught beforehand, was that um, rural sociology was on its way out. I think it's gone now. Um, and that, that for the most part, um, land grant meant for me like, like agribusiness. I mean, the, it's the Tyson Center for Poultry Excellence. Um, so it, it, it's unequivocal kind of there. I mean, it's not, and it's not to say that there aren't some, but like, I, I wasn't within those discussions. When I, my book came out with, you know, working undercover for two summers at a Tyson poultry plant, somebody tried to come, have me come over and talk to the poultry, you know, and it never happened. I mean, so there, it was hard to have those discussions, but anyway, that's yeah. sort of aside. Yeah, just a comment. Um, so just to illustrate the amount of agreement that finding the right process to talk about can generate. 
uh, we were having breakfast this morning. Completely accidentally, I sat on that table and, and started chatting, and we discovered that uh, we have both worked for Tyson. <laughs> After my undergraduate degree, I worked for Tyson. And I was a, cons a labor consultant whose sole job was to solve this big optimization problem, to figure out how to keep the most workers from turning over with the least amount of wage. And even though I come from an entirely sort of different um, spectrum in terms of what I would like to see happen in the public realm, I completely agree with this talk. I mean, if anything needs to happen, it needs to happen through a central process that, that we all agree on, right? So on the outcomes, we're, we're going to disagree forever. But we, we stand a chance to agree on, on the process. So I think that's sort of the direction that, that this whole conference is supposed to be moving us on, right? But what's interesting, I think, and then we were saying that industrial agriculture will, have, will need a labor, you know, a labor movement. But isn't it really just the consumer movement? I mean, Wheaties cost $5 a box. Yeah. When nobody buys $5 box Wheaties. Um, you know, uh, bulk food uh, is affordable, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's upcoming. And I think your point, you know, that we can't feed the world uh, on a local foods movement is true, but I think it's kind of an absurd argument. I think that the change comes from the fringe. If you take 5% of the market, what do you get? You get Coca-Cola selling organic tomatoes. <laughs> so I'm thinking that this absolutism is maybe a little missing. I, I think you're trying to nibble at the edge, you're trying to change behavior. Uh, Tyson makes money, that's all they do. That's their purpose, they've commodified food. And they're going to make a lot of money and they'll continue to, but as they, if their market share cuts, if they lose 3%, 5%, 6%, they change. Maybe about 5%, uh, I, would give, I would hold out hope about 5% for consumer movements, personally. I, I, I just don't think that they're going to bring about sort of the kinds of change that, that I'm sort of thinking about. Um, for, I, uh, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. I mean, I think there are a variety of reasons in terms of the fickleness of consumers and, I mean, all sorts of things that... Yeah, but I mean, I, I think it has to come. I think it has to come from from sort of producers tied to consumers and consumers being sort of part of that. But I, I just think it, it driven by consumers. It. it yeah. But that's all. That's all they respond to. I mean, their their profits are spent in in subordinating government. But they just make different products. If you have an educated consumption, which is home ed, when I took it, um, you tend to buy different things. Okay. All right. That was wonderful. Thank you, Thank you everyone.